Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good middle of the night, wherever you happen to be calling from. Um, my name is Nick Epley. I'm a professor of behavioral science here at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. I'm also the faculty director of the Center for Decision Research that is bringing you this uh, webinar this evening or this morning or this afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Um, This is uh, an unusual circumstance to be in for lots of reasons. Um, I've never given a talk quite like this. Uh, I've never had um, a couple thousand people in my home at one time before. And so we'll do the best that we can here uh, this evening. This is part of a speaker series that we run through the Center for Decision Research at the University of Chicago, where we normally meet in person. And we will again, sorry, let me, uh, let you see me a little more clearly. We will again meet together in person um, starting next fall and we're going to have a regular speaker series like we normally do at the Gleacher Center in downtown Chicago and I hope you can join us for that. We're going to have Todd Rogers uh, visiting us on November 18th. We're going to have Ayala Fishbach with us on February 17th and we're going to have Kat, uh, Katie Milkman with us on May 20th. We will probably also reschedule Alyssa Fishbane's talk who was scheduled to come in uh, and speak to us in April, but we had to cancel that. The Center for Decision Research is a group of behavioral scientists at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business and, and the broader University of Chicago community where we mostly uh, provide research infrastructure for faculty like me who are doing experiments on human beings to try to understand how we think and act and make choices better. Um, right now we're moving a lot of our research to online uh, sources, but we will be back to running in labs as soon as this pandemic um, is behind us. So we are having this special event tonight because of the rather extraordinary circumstances we are in. I thank you all for joining us here this evening um, to talk about one aspect of this pandemic that, that we are in. We are uh, having to do this online, of course, because we're not able to meet in person. That's an unusual experience. I'm not able to um, I'm, I'm not able to see any of you. You're not able to laugh at my jokes. I'm speaking to a computer screen which is the first time uh, ever for me. But there's some amazing things that this online opportunity affords us. Uh, and you can see one of them right here. We had over 2000 registrations for this event, which is an remark remarkable reach. It speaks to um, the University of Chicago community as well as the broader community that has, that has interest in the research that we do. I know we have people uh, joining, in fact, from my old high school in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, even tonight. And folks are joining us from all over the world, which again is a rather remarkable thing that online interaction now allows us to do. If we were in the Gleacher Center, you wouldn't all be with me uh, right now. And what I wanna do this evening is spend some time talking about one element of our research that we think is relevant to the current situation that we are in. Uh, and that situation is really all consuming. There just aren't, aren't superlatives big enough to describe the nature of this pandemic that we are going through and it affects us in so many different ways. First off, it doesn't care a whole lot about boundaries. It's, um, it's affecting people all around the world at rates that uh, are changing on a daily basis. The numbers of coronavirus cases continue to rise around the world and one thing I'd like to do here at the beginning is get a sense of how the coronavirus pandemic is actually affecting all of us because it affects all of us in different ways, uh, the audience in different ways. And so one of the things that the online feature allows us to do is to poll you. And so we're going to try that uh, now. I'm going to ask you three different questions one at a time. We'll start with the first one just to get a sense of how the coronavirus, coronavirus is affecting us. So the first question is this one. Do you know someone personally, a family member, a friend, a colleague, or an acquaintance who has contracted coronavirus? You can indicate yes or no. We'll wait a few minutes to see what people's responses are. I actually just had the very first person in my social network test positive today that I 
that I know of. Mark, can we see the results here of this? We're all getting used to this new feature. So about uh, about half of you, 50-50, a little less, uh, have, have somebody who's tested positive that you know of. Um, it's affecting us all over the country and certainly all over um, the world. How about this? Are you afraid of losing your job because of the economic downturn caused by the corona, uh, coronavirus pandemic, by COVID-19? Just yes or no here. Mark, can we see the results? So again, about 40-60 uh, about split here, 43% of you, yes, are afraid of losing your job. Um, and how about this one? Have you been practicing social distancing this week? So just today, two more states in the United States announced uh, uh, closures or uh, shelter in place orders, Nevada and Florida did. Have you been practicing social distancing over this past week? <laughs> Virtually. Virtually everybody has, uh, almost 100% uh, of you have been practicing social distancing. And this, in fact, um, is what I'm here to talk to you about tonight is the consequences of this. There's di different expertise. This year is showing you the social distancing orders around the globe. This is not just a phenomenon, of course, in the United States. This is happening everywhere on the planet. This is unprecedented. This amount of social coordination actually to keep us disconnected from each other. Different expertise is required to tackle the massive nature of this pandemic, doctors and nurses are flooding the hospitals to deal with the people who are sick and dying. Economists are desperately trying to figure out how is it that we go about saving people's livelihoods through all of this. Um, and psychologists like myself uh, are focusing on, on this particular phenomenon, on this never before experienced phenomena on the planet where we are desperately trying to keep physically distanced from each other to stop the spread of this virus that is both uh, sticky, passes from one person to another very easily, uh, and is deadly. This runs against our nature in so many ways. We are a deeply social species. This is not a new phenomena in any way. Uh, this has been long known. Aristotle noted centuries ago that man is by nature a social animal, an individual who is unsocial naturally or not accidentally. He wrote is either neat, is either beneath our notice or more than human society is something that precedes the individual anyone who either cannot lead the common life or is self-sufficient so self-sufficient as not to need to and therefore does not partake of society is either a beast or a god we are not beasts or gods here we are human beings and this is an unusual experience for us you can see the importance of sociality in human beings almost everywhere you look. You see it when you just look between our ears. So our brains are uniquely designed and equipped and shaped through evolution uh, to actually connect with other people, to enable the kind of social cognition that we need to keep 
track of each other's thoughts and beliefs and attitudes, our cerebral cortex. This fat part here above our brain is about three times larger uh, than our uh, nearest primate uh, ancestor, the chimpanzee. And all of that neural capacity, of course, is good for lots and lots of different things. But what it really seems to be good and important for is social stuff. So if you look across primate species, what you see is that the size of the neocortex relative to the rest of the brain is positively correlated, not with the physical complexity of the environment in which the species lives, but rather with the social complexity in which it lives. So the larger the group size that a primate species inhabits, on average, the larger the neocortex is relative to the brains. Down here in the lower right, you see human beings represented in the upper right-hand corner of this graph. We are the most social of all primates, and we have the largest neocortex relative to the rest of our brains. You see this in experiments as well. If you take rhesus macaques and you house them in larger versus smaller primate groups, you see differences in brain growth, um, particularly gray matter growth. If you are housed in larger social, social groups, your brain actually gets larger than if you're housed in smaller social groups. And this affects not just um, the nature of our brain, it also shows up in, uh, in importance in terms, of our, in terms of our physical health. This is some of the most amazing data that I've come across in my years as a behavioral scientist. This comes from the epidemiological literature where if you look at risk factors for morbidity, this is in particular poor physical health, especially uh, cardiovascular functioning uh, is, is a big one, cardiovascular health, you find that social relationships are really massive risk factors for morbidity. So this is uh, the take home message from a science paper uh, doing a meta-analysis of risk factors for uh, morbidity published in 1988. And what they write here, what they found is that social relationships, in particular the quality of social relationships or the relative lack thereof of those social relationships, constitute a major risk factor for health, rivaling the effect of well-established risk factors such as cigarette smoking, blood pressure, blood lipids, obesity, and physical activity. Being lonely is as bad for your health as cigarette smoking, smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's a stunning result. And it shows up not just in poor physical health, it also shows in the likelihood of death. So what I'm showing you here is a meta-analysis by Julie Holt Lundstedt and her colleagues, uh, a meta-analysis of risk factors for death. So these are odds ratios of death if you're in the top quadrants or the bottom, bottom quadrants along these dimensions. I won't get into the details of what these odds ratios means. I'll just point out that the larger the black bar, the greater likelihood being low on that factor is for death. Uh, or partake, partaking in that activity is for death. So what you can see here is on the top, these are all the social relationship factors. Um, and these are particularly lacking uh, social connection uh, is a significant risk factor for death, rivaling the risk factor associated with, again, smoking 15 cigarettes or, or less a day. And it's much, much larger than, for instance, whether you happen to be uh, skinny or not. Uh, it's larger than air pollution. It's larger than physical activity and exercise, things we spend an awful lot of time worrying about as societies. How do we get people to exercise more, uh, smoke less, and so on? Uh, and yet these social relationship factors are massive. And there are two aspects of the social relationship factors that are really powerful. One is objective social isolation. So how connected do you actually feel? Uh, sorry, is objective social isolation. How many other people do you actually have uh, around you in your life, number of friends and those sorts of things. That's a risk factor for death because if you come down sick with COVID-19 uh, and there's nobody around to take you to the hospital, you, uh, you, you can, uh, of course, die earlier. Um, but also uh, subjective social isolation is a meaningful risk factor for death uh, as well. Just feeling alone, the sense that you are not connected to other people, that you are lonely is also a significant risk factor. And that's because it is a social stress, uh, social stressor. It increases the cortisol uh, level in your, your blood. And if that reaches chronic levels where we experience this a lot, that can compromise your immune system, uh, compromise your cardiovascular health, and can make you susceptible to a whole host of different kinds of bad conditions. So uh, you don't die of loneliness, you die of something else, but it is an underlying cause. I should say, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this presentation that if you have questions as I'm going along, I'm going to spend about 50 minutes uh, uh, 
talking here. We have other producers who are monitoring the question and answer window. If you have questions for me, please type them into the question and answer window and I will take about 15 minutes at the end to answer as many of them as I can. You also see the importance of sociality showing up in uh, people's well-being and their happiness and their satisfaction with life. And you see this again being a surprisingly large determinant of our happiness and our well-being. The best way to show you this, I think, is to show you data from this, uh, from this paper here. This is a, a paper that was published in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by Danny Kahneman and Agnes Deaton, two, no two Nobel Prize winners in economics, but neither of them economists, one uh, uh, psychologist, Danny Kahneman, and one uh, sociologist, Agnes Deaton. And what they did was they al analyzed about half a million uh, survey responses from uh, a random sample of Americans conducted by Gallup. And they were interested essentially in how people felt. And the crux, the main focus of the paper was really how income, how the amount of money that you were making affected how you felt about life, about your positive affect, um, reported happiness, smiling, and joy. So how much positive affect you feel on a daily basis. Negative affect, which is uh, feeling worried or sad. This is reverse scored here. So that higher numbers indicate less negative affect. So it's on running the same direction as positive affect. They measured people's reported stress, um, uh, whether you were uh, experiencing stress the prior day. What I'll show you here is the percent who reported not feeling stress, uh, as well as a measure of social comparison, which is really how your life compares to others. That's not a measure of well-being or happiness. That's a measure of social comparison. And their main question was how these factors, how well-being is affected uh, by income. Do people who make more, for instance, experience more, more money? Do they experience more positive affect? And the answer, as you can see in this graph, is clearly yes, that is Obvious, yes, of course, making more money brings you more positive affect, less negative affect, uh, 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 less stress-free uh, life, um, and makes you think you're doing better than others. Notice, though, that that peaks off pretty early. So one of the things that they found uh, in their data was that you see this curve here getting flat. So as you make more money, your positive affect continues to go up and up and up, but then it flattens out, and you have a hard time detecting uh, any effects on positive affect from increased income beyond a certain point at which it satiates. And the point that they found uh, in this particular paper where income no longer contributes to positive affect on average is about $75,000 is right about uh, in here. This has now been replicated around the world and you see similar satiation patterns uh, uh, around the world. That is more money does not buy you more and more happiness. The real effects here come on the lower end. Being poor is miserable is what these data suggest. But what's interesting for our purposes tonight is not actually this, not this figure here. What's interesting for our purposes is uh, this, I think, more interesting uh, data. This comes from table one. It's complicated here. Uh, let me walk you through it. This is the most interesting thing about this paper. It's not what they got a whole lot of press for because what they were able to do was to compare how income, making a lot of money versus relatively little money, affects your well being, positive affect uh, here, blue affect, negative affect, and so on, um, compared to other things that also affect our well being. And so what they did was they looked at what's the effect. Uh, of income on positive affect between the people who are at the top of our income distribution versus at the bottom of our distrib distribution. So they just split the distribution in half, uh, compare the top against the bottom. What this is is a regression coefficient. For those of you who are not uh, statistically inclined, um, all you need to know is that this is number is positive, indicating that the more money you make, uh, the more positive affect you experience. And also this number is not very big, indicating that the effect, although positive, is not uh, a crushing. Effect. What they then do, though, is they compare that effect, the difference here between high and low income. They compare that effect size, that difference between being high or low on all of these other dimensions that can also affect well-being. So, and then just calculate a ratio. So, uh, what effect, for instance, does being above the median in, in, in the amount of insurance you have versus below the median insurance you have, what effect does that have on your happiness compared to being high versus low in wealth? Okay. The difference between the high income and the low income groups here was about $58,000 is about a fourfold increase in your salary going from low income to high income. 
And so what we now has, have is a set of ratios here. So high income compared to itself, of course, is a ratio of one. But let me show you what, uh, what this means. So insured, this is a median split on how much insurance you have. And what you find is that being relatively high versus low in insurance gets you about 40% of the effect that high versus low income does. Uh, being relatively old gives you about 80%. Uh, old versus young gives you about 80% of the positive affect that being relatively high versus low in income does. Um, good news for everybody out there who's getting older. Uh, data are very clear that the older you get, the happier you tend to get. That's a very reliable result. Uh, your worst years on average uh, tend to be behind you. So that's good news. Notice being religious here actually is a little bigger effect size than high versus low income. Um, a little bit bigger. Those who are religious report more positive affect than those um, those who are, are, are not religious. But notice what's the really big effect uh, here, at least in terms of positive affect, how much happiness you feel in this data set? It's this social force right here. It's the extent to which you reported feeling alone yesterday. That's seven times bigger in terms of experienced positive affect or relative to the, the, the lack of positive affect if you are feeling alone or isolated than high versus low income. That is a huge effect on your well-being. And in fact, if, if I want to know as a behavioral scientist, as a psychologist, how happy you are, there are actually two questions that I would prioritize over how much money you make. One is to ask you about how meaningful you find your work to be. And the other is for you to tell me about the quality of your social relationships. One group of psychologists went so far as to report that no variable is sufficient for happiness, but having good social relations seems to be necessary, a necessary factor when we look in the data set. And so it's not surprising then that the social psychologist or the behavioral scientist recommendation for living a happier life full of more well-being is to go out and be more social, in particular to be more pro-social. That is to act towards others in ways that strengthen your relationships and the data support this time and time again. So go out and act more extroverted. When you put people in experiments and you ask them to go out and act more extroverted, that is to try to connect with other people or to act assertively when you're out in the world, people report feeling happier than when you ask them to go out in the world and act introverted. And yes, that even shows up for introverts. Both extroverts and introverts report, report feeling happier when you tell them, when you ask them to go out and act extroverted versus introverted. What differs between extroverts and introverts are their expectations or their beliefs about how they're going to feel. Extroverts think they'll be happier if they go out and act extroverted, whereas introverts think they'll be happier if they act introverted. And as far as we can tell, those expectations just aren't right, uh, that even introverts are happier when they go out and ex extroverted in the world. Express gratitude to other people. Do the kinds of activities that actually build social relations and remind you of the important people in your life. Everybody who's on this chat with me right now can think about somebody in their life who has done something really meaningful for them that you feel grateful for. Expressing that makes you feel better because it strengthens those relationships. And go out and be kind. Turns out if you give people $20 and you ask them to go out and spend it either on themselves or somebody else, people report feeling happier if they go out and spend that money on somebody else than if they spend that money on themselves, even though, again, they expect, if anything, the opposite result. The picture that I'm showing you here is one that probably many of you have seen. These are a group of healthcare workers who are uh, volunteering their time. They are flying to New York City to help with the coronavirus crisis that's unfolding there right now. Being kind, doing kind things for others strengthens relationships and makes people feel good. Given how social we are, these effects are not surprising. And yet, if you look out in the world, you see lots of opportunities where people could be doing these things, could be acting more extroverted, could be expressing gratitude, could be acting more kind, and yet they aren't for some reason. There seem to be barriers to connecting with others. And this is what we're going to talk about tonight. What are the barriers that keep us from connecting meaningfully with others? And how do we remove those to connect with other people more effectively to enhance both their well-being and our own in ways that I think are going to be especially important at this time because people's mood is not just sort of a nice 
uh, phenomena to have. It's not just good to feel good. It turns out feeling connected is also critically important for your health and your immune system functioning. One obvious barrier that occurs to everybody on this call right now is all of the physical distancing or the social distancing metrics that we have, uh, measures that we have in place right now. We cannot physically touch other people. We cannot physically be close to other people. You may want to hug a friend or a relative or a loved one and sometimes tragically you are unable to do that. And although physical distance of course is important for social distance, the social distancing that we are all going through is actually a bit of a misnomer because what we're being asked to do is keep physical distance from each other, but social distance is a different phenomena. In fact, long before we were ever asked to physically distance from each other, I spent lots of time, I do this every day in my life when we're not in our current situation, um, riding this train here into uh, Hyde Park where my office is in the University of Chicago. And I see people in very close proximity to each other who are not in fact socially connecting to each other at all. Every day I get on this train and I see the same kind of drill. People line up along the outside. We then move to the next uh, stop. People get on, they line up here next to them. Um, and then even though they're cheek to jowl, they are as close to two people as you can be without sitting on somebody else's lap. They are close in physical proximity. That barrier is eliminated. What do they do on their 45 minute ride into Chicago? Typically nothing. They ignore each other. They are close in physical proximity, but miles apart in social proximity. They are not connecting. I see this every day. Um, time and time and time again every day is the same drill and I don't think there's anything unusual about Chicago. This is a phenomenon that happens in lots of places, albeit not all over the world. I understand we can talk about that maybe in the question and answer session, but there are lots of places where people seem reluctant. Even though they're close to other people in close physical proximity, they seem reluctant to reach out and connect to others. It's possible this is a feature of our modern society where we are all carrying around tools of, uh, of, of social uh, distraction here with us in our daily lives, which now actually, interestingly, are the only ways we're really able to connect uh, with others. But I don't think that's, uh, this is only a modern phenomena. Um, throughout history, people have, there have been barriers to engaging with people socially or connecting with other people socially, being socially close with others, even when you're in close physical proximity. And so this is the kind of social, uh, social connection that I want to talk about tonight, the barriers to socially connecting with other people. We all know that you can be close to people in physical proximity and yet be miles apart from them, feel miles apart from them, feel lonely. And we can also be miles apart from people with technology now that enables us to feel like we're right there. I don't know if you're feeling like you're right in my living room right now, but you are close uh, to, to being that, certainly closer uh, than we would be without this technology. <clears throat> and so what are some of these barriers that keep us from connecting to other people, whether we're in close physical proximity to them or not? And what I want to suggest tonight is that one of the most, one of, one of the barriers, one of the barriers that we know from data and evidence um, are a set of psychological barriers that actually come from you. I mean, now, I don't, I don't mean you in particular, you person. I mean all of us. I mean from us. They come from us, the way we think about other people. And in particular, they come from small but I think important mistakes we make in thinking about the minds of others and how they are going to react to us if we reach out and try to engage or connect with them. And the point I want to try to make to you tonight is that we find evidence time and time again in one experiment after another that people tend to underestimate the positive impact that they are going to have on another person and hence on themselves when they reach out and try to connect with others. Other people are deeply social agents. It seems that we seem to underestimate that in a way that creates a barrier. If I think you don't really want to connect with me, I'm not going to reach out and engage in conversation, talk about deep issues, or do things that would connect me to you that would actually bring us closer together. And I think this is important at all stages, really, of social decision making, where we are making decisions about, do I approach you or do I avoid you? Life is flooded with these kinds of choices, where I have a chance to either reach out with you and connect with you in some way, or to stay disconnected from you uh, and to keep separate from you in some way. 
So do I reach out uh, and say hello? Do I actually, uh, they, it affects decisions about whether I engage or connect with you or not. Do I say hello? Do I connect with you if you're a stranger or a friend? Do I reach out and express support when I know that you are in need in a meaningful way that actually provides support for somebody? Once we're actually trying to engage with somebody, we have to figure out how to do it. Modern life gives us all sorts of opportunities for connecting with others, all sorts of different ways of engaging with other people. Should we connect interactively with other people or passively at more of a distance? Uh, should uh, I engage uh, in a conversation with you using more versus less intimate media? I can type to you or I can do what we're doing right now. I can talk to you. Uh, should I dig deeper? Once we're actually having a conversation, I have to decide uh, what to talk about. Right? How to how to have this conversation? Should I keep it kind of light, or should I engage in deeper and more meaningful conversation? And it also affects, I think, our choices about what to do uh, with others. There are lots of pro-social activities that strengthen social bonds, but if we underestimate the positive impact that these different acts, expressing gratitude, sharing our kind thoughts, performing kind acts, uh, enabling kindness in others by asking for help, if we underestimate the positive impact that these acts can have on others, we might be overly reluctant to engage in them. And I think this is an especially important uh, issue for us right now because we are really now having to make lots of deliberate choices about all of these issues because social connection isn't as easy or as automatic for us as it used to be. So let me take each of these in turn. I'm gonna show you one or two experiments for each of these different uh, uh, lines here on this screen. So first, whether to, should I connect with you? Should I reach out and say hello or should I keep my distance from you in some way? Do people have an accurate sense of how this is gonna affect them and others? Well, to find this out, uh, we ran an experiment that really got me started down this line of research uh, about a decade ago, now a, a little less than that. Um, got me started down this line of research that I'm gonna be talking to you about tonight and is still informing a lot of the work that we're doing in my lab. So we started here on the train line, that train line rather, that I ride uh, into Hyde Park um, in the University of Chicago right in here every day. We live down here on the far south side of Chicago. I'm right about here in Flossmore, Illinois right now. We ran this experiment in uh, the, at this station right here in, in Homewood, Illinois. And what we did was we, we sent uh, my research assistant, this is Jasmine Kwong, who, uh, who is now one of our staff members at, uh, at the CDR and uh, is one of our MBA alums. We sent her and, and other staff into the bowels of the Homewood, Illinois train station uh, and signed people up for a rather unusual experiment. We signed them up for a computer study. We handed them, uh, if they were interested, we then handed them an envelope that had a $5 Starbucks gift card in it, which turns out to be the most valuable incentive on the planet. You can get people to do anything for a $5 Starbucks gift card. We have found out, even talked to strangers on the train. Um, and we, at that point, then randomly assigned them to one of three conditions to see how they would actually feel if they were more versus less social on the train that morning. So what we did in one condition was we told them, to uh, actually just keep to themselves, just to try to enjoy their solitude on the commute in that morning. Just keep yourself focused on your day ahead. That was our solitude condition. Second condition was our control condition, our baseline condition. We told them to do whatever they normally do. Uh, what they normally do is keep uh, to themselves, but they could do whatever they wanted on the train that day. In the third condition, we told them to do something somewhat radical. We told them to reach out and actually say hello to somebody, try to connect with another person on the train, try to learn something about him or her when he or she and comes, sits, comes and sits down next to you. Um, try to start a, a, a conversation, try to make a connection that day. At the end of their commute, they then filled out a short survey for us that included a bunch of different uh, measures. I'm only gonna show you the, the first three, uh, uh, reporting how they felt on their commute how positive their uh, commute was, how pleasant their commute was that day compared to normal, how happy they felt uh, after their commute and how sad they felt after their commute. We also, also asked them how productive they were after their commute. Uh, results didn't vary across those conditions. Um, so we don't, we don't see any effect on, on reported productivity either because people don't get stuff done on the train most days, which I think is probably what's going on, um, or because uh, once you give them a goal, they feel productive no matter what they're, what, no matter what they're doing. We don't, we don't quite know what's going on there, but um, we didn't find differences across conditions. And so the question is, um, are highly social 
agents, if they reach out and connect with other people, do they actually feel happier in this context? Do they have a more positive commute than if they keep to themselves? Well, here are the results. This is a standardized index of those first three measures that I described to you. How pleasant was your compute compared to normal? How happy are you and how sad are you? Reverse score. These are averaged into a composite. Who had the most positive commute? Well, it was those who were the most social. Just like we see in other experiments, those we asked to act extroverted to try to connect with somebody else reported having the most positive commute and those we asked to keep to themselves reported having the least positive commute. Those in the control condition were right in the middle. This uh, We've done a lot of experiments on this by now. Uh, the control condition bounces around quite a bit. It typically looks more like the solitude condition in these cases where people aren't naturally connecting uh, with others. But uh, these data make it clear that it wasn't in fact unpleasant to talk with other people. Um, in fact, it was more pleasant than keeping it themselves. We just replicated these studies, by the way, um, this past summer in London, where we see exactly the same effects on people's actual behavior. Even Londoners coming in and out of the city uh, enjoy talking to a stranger more than keeping to themselves. And the effect size on that is, is essentially identical to what we have right here, uh, even though we have a much, much larger sample in that study. So if connecting with others is pleasant, it, makes us enjoy this otherwise unpleasant commute more, why aren't people doing it? Well, what I suggested to you at the beginning was that we might undervalue or underestimate how positive our attempts to reach out to other people will be received and hence how positive they will make us feel. So to find out if that could be going on, notice that's a, me a measure of people's expectations. People might believe that connecting with a stranger will be unpleasant and hence not do it. To see if that could be going on, um, what we did was we uh, ran another condition where we measured people's expectations, their beliefs about how connecting with another person uh, would uh, affect their, their positivity. And what you see here is that people actually reported uh, believing that they would feel, expected to feel, the least positive in the connection condition and the most positive in the solitude condition. These were people's predictions about how they would feel if they were randomly assigned to each of these conditions. People's expectations were simply wrong. They were just backwards. They thought they'd be happiest keeping to themselves and least happy connecting to others. In fact, precisely the opposite was true. We see this um, in experiments time and time again. Here's another experiment on, on buses uh, coming into downtown uh, Chicago. Again, we see the same pattern here. And notice that people's behavior here is in some ways rational. As Gary Becker, famous uh, Nobel laureate from the University of Chicago, mentioned the rational in his Nobel address. Uh, the rational analysis assumes that individuals maximize welfare as they conceive it. Their behavior is forward looking. Uh, but note here the critical part of rationality is that people behave in ways that are consistent with their conceptions or their expectations. Those expectations don't always need to be accurate. And indeed, our expectations of how we'll feel when we reach out and connect to others seems to be systematically mistaken. People are behaving rationally here, but they just seem to be wrong. There's a gap between how people think they would feel if they reach out and connect with others and how they actually feel. So this raises the question of where this gap comes from. Why is it the connection surprisingly pleasant? couple possibilities. One is that maybe just people remember the, the what's informing their expectations, their memory of the, the worst interaction they've ever had, and that's coming to their mind and, and polluting their expectations. We actually don't find that to be the case. In fact, when people imagine having a conversation, they imagine that it will actually go well and that they will in, in, enjoy it. That doesn't seem to be what's going on. Instead, what seems to be going on is people underestimate how interested our, others are in engaging with them in the first place. People tend to think that others don't want to talk to them, and so it will be difficult or unpleasant or hard to actually start a conversation. It seems that people underestimate others' prosociality. Indeed, on the trains uh, in Chicago, people estimated only about 41% of people would be willing to talk to them. On the buses, estimated 42% would be willing to talk to them. In fact, uh, nearly everybody in our connection condition uh, responded to us, and everybody who responded to us said that they actually talked to somebody. It didn't seem to be that they were uh, rejected at all. I think we underestimate uh, how willing others are to uh, engage with us. And that might then make us reluctant to reach out to others in lots, of, uh, uh, in lots of ways. We don't just reach out to strangers. Sometimes we reach out like we are now to people who we know uh, are in need, who need some support for us. Do we reach out and connect with them? Say, 
we're sorry? Do we give them a call? Do we go over and visit in some way? Do we do what we think uh, would benefit them in some way? Do we reach out and express support? We find again here that people underestimate how positive their efforts to reach out and express support to other people will be. This is an experiment that we conducted where we had people think about somebody in their life who needs some support for them for some reason. They wrote a letter to that person, mailed it to that person. They predicted how that person would feel and we then uh, contacted the person who was reported, uh, uh, contacted, and they reported to us how they actually felt. We then compared expectations against the actual experience of receiving this letter. Um, these are people's expectations, the letter writer's expectations. We didn't hear back from all of the, the letter recipients, so that's an unfortunate aspect of this experiment. I'll show you a better experiment in just a moment. Um, this is how people think their re letter recipient will feel. They think the letter recipient will feel pretty positive, but that it'll be somewhat awkward um, and that they will feel sort of moderately supportive. Uh, people aren't clueless about this. They recognize this will be generally a positive experience experience, maybe a little bit weird, but in fact, they're systematically miscalibrated on all of these dimensions. They slightly underestimate how positive uh, the other person will feel, meaningfully overestimate how awkward it'll be, and they underestimate how supported they'll feel. That is, they think it's going to be a more negative experience for the recipient than it actually is. And if we break this down further, it gets even more interesting. So people wrote to folks who are relatively close or relatively distant uh, to them. This is just a split uh, of our data. Uh, across how close they were to the person that they uh, were writing um, writing a letter to. And what you can see here on the left is that the gap between the red and the black bar is actually pretty small here. People had some sense that people who they were already close to would appreciate being reached out to. But what they didn't appreciate is that people who are further outside our social circle, people we're more distant from, in fact, would appreciate it just as much as the people we are close to, would feel no more awkward and would feel equally supported. The strength of the re relationship didn't affect how the recipient felt. It only affected how the letter writers thought their recipients would feel. There are lots of people in your extended networks that you could reach out to, and they're going to feel as good as your close friends might these data at least suggest. We see the same gap in a laboratory experiment with strangers where we bring people in the lab, ask one person to say what they need support for, have the other person try to reach out and express to that person support to that person, in this case, face to face. Um, the expressors predict, so this is before the, the, the session, they underestimate how positive their uh, recipient will feel after uh, the, uh, the conversation, overestimate how awkward the recipient will feel when a stranger tries to express support to them, and underestimate how supported the stranger will feel when you reach out and express the support to them. When people reach out to others, even to distant others, it tends to go better than people think. Once we've decided to engage with other people, though, we still see these kinds of barriers. So how is it we go about engaging with other people? Modern life gives us lots of opportunities. We can meet face to face and actually talk with other people, or at least we used to be able to do that. Now we do this uh, with each other, uh, nicely distance apart from each other. Um, but modern life gives us lots of other opportunities as well. This is my lovely daughter, Lindsay, my youngest daughter. I figured I would need a smile at this point in the lecture, and there it is. Well, right? We can connect to other people over email or the phone, or we can text with them. We can do what we're doing now, a Zoom chat or WeChat or FaceTime, right? And these different ways, these different methods of connecting vary along interesting dimensions that vary how close to face-to-face -face contact, sort of what we might think of as real interaction we might get with somebody. They vary in whether it's synchronous versus asynchronous interaction. So are we actively interacting with each other going back and forth, or are we doing what we're doing right now, which is I'm speaking and you're listening, more of a monotone experience, unfortunately. How intimate is the media that we're connecting with? Some media are, are naturally more intimate. They connect us more to the mind of another person, such as through a person's voice, than more distant media like text that lack the paralinguistic cues that convey thought and emotion to others. And we can also have to make a decision about what do we talk about, right? How, to, how do we conduct this conversation? How deep and intimate do uh, a topic do we discuss? I think our tendency to underestimate how positively our social acts will be received, received causes us to be a little more distant for e with each of these decisions as well. Let me take each one in turn. This is an experiment Mike Cardis, one of my PhD students, uh, his family is watching with us tonight. Hello, the Cardis family. Uh, and I conducted a, a little while ago where we had strangers 
<clears throat> respond to five questions in sort of a get to know you session, either in monologue where one person speaks and then the other person listens to all of those, or in dialogue where they go back and forth with an actual active interaction where they can respond meaningfully to e each other. They report their expectations of how essentially connected uh, they'll feel to the other person, how much will they have in common with this person, how similar will they feel to this person, how much will they have to talk about, how much would they like the other person before they engage in the interaction either over monologue or over dialogue. And then they report their actual experience afterwards. And here are the results that we get on this sense of how much in common will we have, how much will I like you. People don't think that how they connect is going to matter. But in fact, it matters a lot. The, sync, the, the, the active synchronous interaction, the back and forth that happens in live conversational interaction makes people feel more connected in dialogue than in monologue and people miss the important of that, importance of that social cue. How about the intimacy of the media we're using? The closest you're gonna to get to another person's mind is actually through their voice when they tell you what's on their mind using all the cues at their disposal. Uh, but again, misunderstanding how that more intimate media can affect our interactions could lead people to avoid uh, connecting with others as deeply as they could. In this experiment, we asked people to, to reconnect with an old friend, either over email or, or, or uh, their voice. Uh, first, they reported their expectations for how they would feel when they reconnected with this old friend that they hadn't talked to in a couple of years. People expected um, that if they emailed the person, they would feel a little uh, less of a bond with them than if they talked to them. Uh, felt a little less like they would connect, reconnect if they connected with them over email versus the phone. But notice they also thought it would be more awkward to talk to the person over the phone than to email. That is that close social contact, just calling somebody out of the blue after you've been disconnected for a while is just going to be weird. We also then ask them to report their preference, how they would like to connect with the other person. And what you can see here is that this anticipated awkwardness, the sense that this is going to be weird, drove their choice. A majority of people then choose, chose uh, to wanted to reconnect over email than over voice. We didn't actually let them do this. What we then did was we ran an experiment where we randomly assigned them to either reconnect with their old friend over email, a more distant social uh, media, or over the phone a more close social media and they reported their experience. We see that people's expectations about strength of bond and sense of connecting were right. That is, they did feel more connected when they talked than when they typed, but notice there was no difference in awkwardness. So this mistaken sense that it would be weird if I reached out and connected to you in this more intimate way, that that would be weird and uncomfortable, that you wouldn't appreciate that very much push people towards choosing an inferior media for connecting with other people. If you really want to reconnect with somebody at this time in particular, pick up the phone or do what we're doing now so you can actually hear what a person has to say. And finally, how about the, the depth of the conversation, how intimate the conversation is? Uh, this is an experiment where we asked people to uh, engage in deep talk. This was at a conference at a, at a hedge fund. Um, in particular, we told them we were going to randomly pair them up with a stranger and discuss four deep and intimate questions with this stranger. Um, first, they predicted how they were going to feel. These were the questions that they were going to discuss with a stranger. They predicted that talking about these deep and intimate questions would be pretty awkward. Um, that uh, they would be sort of mod feel moderately happy after the conversation. They would like the stranger that they engage in this deep conversation with somewhat moderately and that they'd have uh, feel sort of a moderate bond with that person. In fact, they were wildly miscalibrated on all of these dimensions. Uh, it was way less awkward than they expected. They felt much more connected to the other person when they engaged in deep conversation. They liked the person a lot more than they expected after deep conversation and they felt a stronger bond. When we asked people to engage in deeper talk than they normally would. This was an experiment we did in Millennium Park. People generate four questions to ask to another person. They then generated four deeper questions to ask to another person. Um, they reported their expectations of how connected they would feel. Um, they thought they would feel more awkward when they asked their deeper questions than when they asked their shallower questions. Thought they would feel a little more connected um, when they asked their deeper questions than when they asked their control questions, but didn't think they would be any difference in happiness. We then randomly assign them to ask either the deeper, more intimate questions or their control questions. Uh, and they reported their experience afterwards. Turns out there was no difference in awkwardness between the deeper or the control conditions, both less awkward than they expected, but especially for the deep questions. There was a difference in how connected they felt. They felt more connected when they uh, talked about deeper stuff and they reported feeling happier when they talked about deeper 
than shallower stuff. Reaching out and engaging a little more intimate conversation turns out to be better than people expect. And finally, we see it in the acts that people engage in to actually connect with other people. Uh, people underestimate how positively other people will respond when you express gratitude to them. If you want to feel better today, this is the most powerful thing I would suggest that you can do is reach out and express gratitude to somebody who's done something meaningful for them. I do this every year now in my MBA class. Uh, I've done this now with uh, about five, 500 people, a little over 500 people. Um, this was the very first of these experiments that I ran. Um, we emailed people's recipients of, of their letters. The letter writers predicted how the recipients respond would respond and the recipients reported how they actually responded. They wrote about really personal stuff. I can't tell you what they wrote about really deep and meaningful things. How did they feel afterwards? Our letter writers felt much more positive than normal. Um, did the letter writers know how their recipients would feel? A bit, yes, but there were also some meaningful gaps, suggested they were underestimating how positive it would feel. Uh, they, we asked them to predict how surprised they'd be to receive it, how surprised they'd be about the contact, how positive they feel afterwards, and how awkward they would feel afterwards. Um, that's what they expected. That's how their recipients actually felt. They underestimated how surprised, significantly underestimated how surprised they'd be to receive it, how surprised they'd be about the content, uh, underestimate how positive they would actually uh, feel. This is actually on a scale that goes from minus five to plus five. I've just added five here so that it's on the same scale. And they overestimated how awkward it would be. It turned out that the recipient felt better than the letter writers expected. What was the recipient's actual positive mood? Um, that's how the recipients actually felt on a scale that went from minus five being much more feeling much more negative than normal to much five feeling much more positive than normal. People feel great when they get these kinds of letters. This is one of these cases where it's better to receive uh, than to give. And I find this time and time again with much larger uh, data sets. Um, how about sharing kind thoughts? Uh, one way to connect with others is to tell people the great things you think about them. Uh, people underestimate how positive this is too. We ran an experiment at the Garfield Park Conservatory in Chicago, Xuan Zhao uh, and I, uh, who's one of our postdocs, where we had people predict how their partner at the uh, conservatory that day would feel, uh, either after doing nothing in particular, just going out and walking around, or after reading three compliments that uh, one person had written for their partner that day. And these compliments were of all different sorts. We now have thousands of these across many different uh, experiments. Here are some examples of what some of the, uh, the, the more typical compliments are. And then of course, there are some uh, somewhat unusual compliments that we can't um, really know what's going on there, but they consider those to be compliments. They predicted how positive their, uh, their partner would feel. Most of these were married couples who'd known each other for 10 years on average. You can see in the compliment condition, they underestimated how positive their recipient would feel. In the control condition, there was no difference. It's not that we just underestimate how positive other people feel generally. It's we underestimate how positive other people will, will feel after we reach out to them in a positive way. Again, those in the compliment condition overestimate how awkward the recipient's gonna feel. No difference in the control condition here. How about performing kind acts? This is an experiment uh, we conducted in Millennium Park in the winter. We had people give away a free cup of hot chocolate to somebody else, predict how the recipient would feel. Uh, we then went and checked how the recipient actually felt. People predicted that the recipient wouldn't think that it was that big of an act. In fact, the recipients think this was kind of a big deal. Small acts of kindness are really valued a lot. And they underestimated how positive the recipient would feel, mostly because they underestimated how that act of warmth would be received positively. The warm cup of cho chocolate creates two sources of value in the recipient. One is how much I like a cup of hot chocolate. The uh, predictors, the, the givers seem to anticipate that. The other was how positively I feel because you gave it to me as an act of kindness. The recipients didn't seem to appreciate that. And if doing kindness makes people feel better than expected, then we can also make other people feel better if we actually ask them for help when we need it. There's another experiment we ran at the Garfield Park Conservatory. We asked people to go out and find somebody to take a picture of them. We gave them a Polaroid camera, which spits out an old school picture of you. We asked our participants to go out and ask somebody, find somebody who would be willing to take a picture of them in front of this beautiful scene, you know, old school style, selfie stick style, um, the way we used to do it. Um, and then we uh, left people with the picture that they took. The requesters 
uh, predicted how the person, they, the helper would feel. And then we just checked with the helper afterwards to find out how they actually felt after they did this act of kindness. The helpers reported being more interested in helping than the requesters expected reported being less inconvenienced than the requesters anticipated and reported being in a more positive mood. They were more happy to help than the requesters actually expected here. You can bring positive experience out of, out of other people by asking them to do kind things for you when, when you need it and thereby strengthen social bonds. Aristotle said centuries ago, man is by nature a social animal. That's clear, we understand this. What we're finding in our data time and time again is that it's not obvious to us that we fully appreciate the extent to which other people are really social in our daily lives. That is, we seem to underestimate other sociality in ways that create a psychological barrier to reaching other, out to other people and strengthening relationships that would make both us and others feel better. And we see this across all of these important decision points where we have to make decisions about whether we reach out to others or not, whether to reach out, how to connect to somebody and what to do. In all of these cases, people underestimate how positively they're received if they try to socially connect with somebody else, even if they're at physical distance. So how do we socially connect at a time of physical distance like this? We turn all those question marks to periods. We reach out to others and say hello to them, even if they're distant from us. We think it might be weird. It's not going to be weird. They're going to be delighted to hear your voice, I would predict. Reach out and express support to people who need it. There are lots, lots and lots and lots who need your support right now. Don't be hesitant. Don't think it's going to be weird. They are going to love hearing from you. When you do engage, you can optimize. It's not ever going to be as good as meeting with people in person, but we can optimize the media that we have at hand now. Connect interactively with other people. Use your phone for what it's good for really good for social connection with our voice or being able to see people and hear them at the same time. And when you are connected to other people, really ask them how they're feeling and how they're doing. Ask meaningful stuff. It's going to not be as awkward as you think. It might go better than you expect. And all of these pro-social acts are all things you can do at a physical distance like we are right now. These can have extraordinary power. At times, they can be magical. The magic of these acts actually occurred to me just yesterday. Just yesterday, in quotes that I got from my dad, pictured right here, and from my close friend and colleague, Ed O'Brien, right here. Dad was telling me last night about getting together with a care receiver that he meets with on a regular basis just to support who's in a nursing home and has some physical issues. And this is what he said. I waited until it was almost time to meet and told him that I would actually be uh, there to see him in person. After all, he knew he was going to be uh, not so happy to talk to him on the phone. We sat on lawn chairs next to his garage at a good social distance. You'd have thought it was Christmas. And that was the part that stuck out to me because Ed said exactly the same thing to me yesterday. Earlier today, our maintenance guy came to fix a water problem and it felt like Christmas came early for all parties. I got to say hi to another human and chat. Reaching out to other people is a gift to them. It's a gift of social connection that's more powerful and valued more than we think. You get to be Santa Claus at this time when we are physically distancing. And we at the University of Chicago, at Booth in particular, are trying to help you reach out and connect with other people uh, more effectively. Try to enable our MBA students to help you a little bit. Our MBA students are super talented. They are care what's going on right now. They want to help. You need to tell us if you are an alum, somebody working for a government agency, a nonprofit organization, how our students can be of help to you. The Rostandi Center for Social Sector Innovation is seeking requests for help from our MBA students to put them to volunteer work in the spring quarter, putting their expertise into practice and accounting and statistical analysis and project management. Do you need an MBA student? Please fill out that form and tell us about it. They will reach out to you to, to, to surprise, try to supply you with a talented MBA who can help you um, meet the goals and the needs that you have right now uh, to, to run your uh, to do the good that you're trying to do out there. Uh, and if you're one of our MBA students right now, just hold tight. The Rostandi Center is going to be in touch with you with more about how you can actually help. And so what I want to do now, we've run a little bit long. I apologize. It's after seven o'clock already. Why don't we take 10 to 15 minutes? If you want to leave now, if time is tight for you, certainly understand. Um, why don't we take some time right now and field some questions? Um, 
you have been answering, asking them, I hope, in the question and answer window. Don Lyons, uh, my lab manager and, and one of our CDR staff has been paying attention and I think may have a few that I can answer now. I'm gonna leave this slide up for you while I'm talking so that you can take pictures of it or jot this down in case you want. Don, what questions did we get tonight? All right, so our first question is from Kristen. It's asking, has this research been looked at in the context of other cultures? I know Zihan, another attendee, asked specifically about um, East Asian cultures like China or Japan. Yeah, these are great questions. Um, the answer is not as much as we would like across these kinds of measures. I'll tell you one quick story. Um, uh, in mid-January, we were getting ready to run Xuan Zhao uh, was getting to re ready to run an experiment where we had people sharing compliments um, with each other in a town called Wuhan. Uh, yeah, I'm not joking. Um, not joking at all. We were getting ready to run an experiment in China on the impact, expected versus actual impact of complimenting other people there um, just before it was shut down. So that experiment is on hold. I will say um, that we have run some of these experiments across cultures. So we've run the social connection studies in other cultures where you wouldn't expect people to maybe enjoy connection in London. We see exactly the same effects there. Um, in general, what I would expect to vary across cultures is not the experience of engaging with others, but rather people's expectations. And those expectations then can drive the differences and norms that we see. So there are parts of the world where people engage with, with each other a lot. There are parts of the world where people uh, express compliments less, less often. East Asian cultures, for instance, seem to compliment each other, express gratitude less often than in other places, such as in Western Europe. My prediction is that those cultural differences come not from differences in the experience of receiving thanks or gratitude, but rather from differences in expectations about these. Um, we are just starting now to run those kinds of experiments. The one piece of data that I will say we have consistent with this is a study that Nadav Klein and I ran um, a few years ago looking at how people evaluate pro-sociality in others and we find no differences across cultures in those patterns of evaluations of pro-social acts and so that's one of the, the reasons why I expect this. We also find similar uh, effects in terms of personality so people of different personality types show relatively little difference in their actual experience of social interaction or social connection. What they show are big differences in their expectations of how these interactions are going to go. But you're going to need to stay tuned for more than my hypotheses on those to see the data on that. Okay, and I've got another question here from Franco. It asks, are you seeing any differences across generations, maybe especially caused by evolving uses of technology or of evolving expectations, saying that my kids just don't face-to-face uh, -face their friends, it's all Snapchat and text. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, there are definitely differences in norms. Again, what we want to know, are there differences in actual experience when you actually call people up and say connect with them or uh, get outside of this text-based media? The experiments that we have run on voice tell us two things. One, they tell us that a person's mind, their thoughts, their emotion, their experience, the fact that they're a thinking agent comes through their voice much more so than in text. We don't see differences across age or generation in that. And the experience of connection um, also comes through in a person's voice more so than in text. We see that the experiment that I showed you earlier with people reaching out to old friends, those were mostly young people. We see the effects with them too. Would I expect the effects to be bigger maybe with older adults? I actually, I actually wouldn't. Again, what I might expect there are expectations about how differences in expectations about how others might respond. I might expect that older generations might not anticipate the negative reaction that we saw in our participants as much from reaching out and calling them on the phone, but that's a hypothesis we have yet to yet to test. That's a great question. Going off those differences in expectations, Tim asks, do you have any view on why some people might seem to be better at this? That is people who might better understand the positive impact across all the pro-sociality dimensions. Yeah, so the only data that we have so far on this uh, suggests that experience is what makes you better. Now, it's, there's sort of a bigger question about why is it we have a hard time recognizing exactly how we're going to be perceived by others and why is there systemat this systematic bias. Notice that this is a hard environment to learn in. 
And in particular, only one kind of action actually allows me to learn. Only approach-oriented actions, actually reaching out and saying hello to you, actually giving you a compliment, actually expressing gratitude to you, actually asking for help, gives me feedback on how you respond to that. Avoidance behavior teaches me nothing. What do I learn if I choose not to talk to you? or not to ask that deeper, meaningful question that I've been meaning to ask, or I don't reach out and express support. I don't learn anything from what that is like. So what we find in our data are that the people who have the most accurate expectations about how these experiences are going to go are just the people who do this more often. And that as you do this more often, you gain insight into how other people actually respond. And it's the folks who are reluctant to engage, who are avoidant, who have the least accurate expectations because they just don't get the data that they would need to calibrate their, their expectations. And I got a question from a few people, um, Anki specifically, asking if you could clarify more about um, the differences between the shallow and deep questions that you talked about earlier. Yeah, so um, the sh so we do a bunch of things in the in these experiments. Mike and Amit Kumar and I have done a lot of these experiments. In the ones that I showed you that we did in Millennium Park, what we had people do was sit down and they wrote questions that they would normally ask to somebody if they were just trying to get to know them. Whatever those questions were, that's what they were. We then set those aside and we asked them to write the questions that would be deeper, more intimate, more personal than they would normally ask. They then wrote those questions. Then we randomly assigned them to ask one more of one or the other. And what do we mean by deep or more intimate? We mean more personally relevant. We mean questions that require more revelation about something private or personal that you might not otherwise share with somebody. So the kinds of questions that we ask people in our deep questions are things like, um, what are you most grateful for in your life? Tell me about it. Uh, tell me about the last time you cried in front of another person. Uh, if you had a crystal ball that could see in the future, what would you want to know? Um, if you, uh, if, 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 uh, is there, is there something in your life that you've always wanted to do? Why haven't you done it? These are not all questions that we have generated, by the way, these are questions that are generated um, <clears throat> from a psychologist named Art Aaron. You may have heard of them. excuse me, that's not coronavirus, that's just allergies. You may have heard them because they became popular in the New York Times um, when these 36 questions that will make anyone fall in love were published there. These are questions that are just uh, relatively more or less intimate. That's what we mean by deep. All right, Nick, thanks so much. We've just got one more question. Okay. Um, it comes from Julia. She's asking, in the real world slash outside of experiments, how would you encourage people who are reluctant to engage to take that first step and engage in pro-social behavior? Yeah, so um, that's always a challenge. Um, one thing we find uh, is that knowing about these effects makes it makes people more willing um, to reach out and connect. So as people have more experience, they do it, they bit more likely to do it. Um, in one of our experiments here in this line of work, again with Xuan Zhao, we find that when we tell people about the results of these experiments, they're more willing to give compliments, they give more compliments. Um, I think the answer to this question is a little like, how would you get people to exercise who aren't normally exercising? The physician's answer to that is just to start, to, to start small, to reach out and just to exercise once. You know how positive it feels over the long run once you start doing it. And I think the same thing is true here now. And so I, let me suggest two things at this time. One is, uh, let's focus on gratitude. Somebody in your life has done something really meaningful for you. Uh, you probably haven't told them how much you appreciate them. Or you can think of somebody like that. Sit down and write them a letter and send it to them telling them that that one will feel great to you, I promise, and they are likely to feel wonderful about it as well. Um, and then uh, try this one, uh, maybe sharing kind thoughts with somebody else. Uh, every time you have a kind thought about somebody, 
sit down and send it to him. A friend of mine, Betsy Levy Palak, uh, she just had a baby earlier this week. She, uh, during the coronavirus uh, pandemic, she's, she wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post that's gonna appear next week. One thing she noticed was that after uh, she gave birth, one of her friends contacted her who, uh, who has just started making it a habit during this time to send a compliment to somebody who, uh, who when, when they think of it, as soon as they have it, and she just got one of those that day saying, you are effing awesome. Um, and it made her feel great. So I would start with those two things. Give a compliment when you have them to share. If you think something nice about somebody, just send it out to them. And if you have something deeper and more meaningful to share with somebody else, write it to them. After that, think about somebody you haven't connected with in a long time. Just give them a call. Hey, would you like to connect? Just on Monday of this week, I was talking with a prospective PhD student. She told me about somebody from middle school who she'd been thinking about. I asked her, why haven't you called her and reconnected? Uh, it would be weird. She's doing it now this week. Just take those little steps, get started. You'll see how that feels and then do it more often. Uh, our habits are just things we do repeatedly. We tend to do things that feel good repeatedly. So once you get started, I think it's more likely that you will continue. Don, is that all we have time for tonight? I believe so. I'd like to thank everyone so much for coming. Yeah, I do too. So thanks everybody. These are, these are hard times. Um, these are challenging circumstances for everybody. There are just endless amounts of needs. Needs uh, for physical health, needs for our economic health, and need for our psychological health. And I hope the data that we talked about tonight can help all of us with that latter point. We are all necessary for maintaining a sense of social connection and well-being at this time of physical distancing, not social distancing, physical distancing. We can stay connected at a distance from each other. And I hope the data that I talked to you about tonight can help you with that, can help you reach out and connect with other folks who need it, both for their well-being and for their health. Thank you so much, everybody. Stay well. I appreciate your involvement here tonight. Go out and do good, and I will hope to see you next fall when we resume in person. Thank you so much.